Welcome to another episode of FemFlex Friday. I'm Whitney Jones here with my co-host, Alina Popa, and we have two amazing guests on today. One we have here in person, this is Corey Morales, and we have her husband, Dr. Morales, on to talk about plastic surgery and the role it plays in the fitness scene. Now, they know this firsthand, why? Because they are both IFBB pros themselves, and so we have tons of questions. But first, we want to thank you guys for both joining us, Corey in studio and Dr. Morales on Zoom. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here. We're super excited and, um, yeah, just excited to talk about the topic. Yeah. And I just want to thank you for taking the time because I think this is a topic of, I, I mean, I work specifically with the industry. Um, and I get a lot of patients who have, you know, interested in plastic surgery, who've had plastic surgery themselves. So, you know, I really appreciate you letting me kind of, you know, speak my words about it. Absolutely. We are really happy you ac accepted to be here because, I mean, obviously you are athletes, both of you, competitive athletes. And then, as you said, the fact that you specialize in athletes and, of course, th that puts you, like, really high on this list, right? So... I was wondering, because I looked a little bit through your competitive history, and both of you guys turned pro at the same show, is that right? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, it was a magical moment. Whitney was there. Uh, was it, so was, it was a fun weekend at Universe 2019. And how rare, I mean, for both, to go pro, it's a huge accomplishment, but then to prep together with a spouse is not easy, but then to both come out with the wins, right. like for both of you guys was pretty freaking amazing. Not gonna lie, it was awesome. <laughs> it, was. it was awesome for me, and I wasn't even that involved. I mean, come on, I wasn't right. the person winning at the right. moment. But yes, and of course, you guys have competed and are still living the healthy lifestyle. You have a show coming up, which I think we're gonna kind of so get into that. So, Corey, you are competing in figure, right? I am, yes. And Dr. Morales, men's uh, classic physique. Classic physique, yes. That's awesome. These are both yeah. great divisions. Oh, yes. We love it. Not easy divisions either. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, we have athletes who all the time are talking about plastic surgery. And so some of the questions that we get, we had to kind of put into our format. We've got some uh, plenty, actually, that we're going to throw at you. But one of my first questions is for athletes in this sport, what is the most common surgery that you see being done on athletes in our sport? For women, it's breast augmentation. Mm -hmm. um, that's number one, by, hands down by far, which is consistent with the uh, cosmetic surgery in, in across the world, really. And the United States in 2020 was uh, the number two most common cosmetic procedure we had. We, we performed as uh, plastic surgeons. Number one is body contouring with uh, liposuction. Oh. Um, and for men, I also yeah. specialize in men as well. So I, I do all athletes. So men have um, issues that typically they want to address. And, the most common thing that they have for bodybuilding specifically is the gland tissue of their chest. It's called gynecomastia. Oh, yes. So um, that's one of my specialties for guys. You know, you know, I don't get a lot of guys that want to talk about it, um, but I would say a lot of men in, uh, that are athletes at some point are considering, you know, improving some of the appearance of their chest. Gosh, that's I'm, quite interesting. I'm shocked that liposuction is number one. I would have never guessed that. I don't know why. I figured breast dog was probably number one across the board, but... That's interesting. And is liposuction across the athletes as well, or just in general the population? No, uh, and just general across normal population. Oh, okay. You know, we're you know bodybuilding and athletes. We're we're you know we keep our we we're in healthier condition typically. But you know, just look at unfortunately the the trend of society. Like you know, I think the body mass index is going up. Right, people are just yeah. getting you know United States. We're just a little bit heavier than I think the rest of the world, and we like to eat. And, um, you know, it, it goes hand in hand with the society right now. It's, I think it's different in different countries. Like Asia, I don't think liposuction is at the top five. I don't think. They're just, they're just you know, they're a little bit, you know, leaner people. Hmm. But uh, cosmetic surgery in general, we're talking about general population. Yeah. You know, liposuction right now is still number one and very, very close second is, a, is breast augmentation. And what would it be? You mentioned Asia. I'm just curious. What would it be number one in Asia? Uh, probably facial surgery. Oh, okay. Wow. Nose, eyes, jaw contouring, that's probably number one, two, and three. Oh, wow. That's interesting, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. Just different cultures and, I mean, wow. But, yeah, America, we, we like to eat, so I guess that <laughs> makes a lot of sense, yeah. <laughs> sadly. <laughs> now, you mentioned, obviously, with the athletes in the sport, breast dog is number one. So, it's not necessary and sandy williamson will always say for women you do not have to have 
a boob job in order to win. But I'm curious on your impression because for me, I see it and it just presents more shape in my opinion um, when the athletes get on stage and sometimes it helps kind of bring out some of that muscularity where otherwise it, it kind of would just fall for lack of a better word, fall flat. <laughs> but what is your impression? Like, do you feel it really adds to the physique when women come in for a breast dog? You know, I have this discussion a lot with my, with all women actually. And for me, as a as a male, like I have my own personal, you know, dislikes and dislikes. It's subjective. As a medical professional, I really respect my patients, and you, I'm here to be here to help you, right? Uh, and it really comes down to confidence. I think women feel a little more confident carrying themselves, especially on stage, when they have a little more, you know, volume restoration of their figure, when they've, you know, dieted down to like 5% body fat, they lost all their breast fat, and they don't have that, that figure and shape anymore. And I think a lot of women who are interested in breast tummy are trying to get that back. And so, you know, for me, the, the big, my big term is always confidence, just getting your confidence back. And I'm able to do, provide some of these procedures to give them a little bit of better confidence. And I, I, that's why I brought Corey, because I want Corey to kind of, you know, she's yes. a woman, she has her own reason to do it. That was you know, my next I'm, question, I'm her husband. Exactly. I, didn't, I didn't make her do this, you know, I'm just, I'm here to, <laughs> you know, it's a perk. It's a perk, yeah. right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, you know, that's why I brought her here. She, you know, she's a woman, she had her own reason to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I had the, the capacity to do it for her. And that's what I wanted to ask you, Corey, because mm -hmm. you have done uh, your, uh, you have uh, breast augmentation as well, yes, right? So when correct. did you do it? Uh, originally did it actually right before I competed the first time, I think 2012. And then um, uh, Roland did an implant exchange for me early last year, uh, actually right before COVID all hit. And um, I did it, I, I think, really for the reason that that, um, that Roland is saying, confidence. And then yes. to that shape, because you do lose the fullness. Um, and I think it just helps give you just a nice, um, naturally more pleasing aesthetic. And mm -hmm. Um, so that's that was why I opted for it, and I've been really pleased with it. So to your point, what is the typical time frame if you're going to get a replacement, like get them redone? What is what do you recommend, Dr. Rowling, when you tell your patients, up oh, now it's time? What's the year span on those? Well, there's this common myth that implants need to replace every ten years. That's actually a myth. Oh, how um, come? That's um, it's these implants we have now, especially the new ones we have now. We're in our fifth generation of, of, of implants, like specifically silicone implants, which I have that you know I have Corey bring. Um, but these implants are extremely so strong. They're very Ooh. they're very soft. They're they're safe. They're, these implants have gone through all the I mean tons of regulations through the FDA. There's only three four vendors in the United States have made the the restrictions and safety requirements required of implants in the human body. There's only four in the United States, which in the world there's like 18. Oh. So you're getting the, really the best products in the world here in the United States because the FDA is just so stringent on you know breast implants, and which is rightfully so, right? So, with that said, is that the implants we're you know using now, these implants will last you the rest of your life. You just leave them alone. I mean, what's going to change? When I tell people all the time that what changes is that your body ages around an implant. Mm -hmm. Your soft tissue gets a little bit thinner, your skin gets a little bit thinner, gravity takes a little bit more toll on you. And everyone has a little bit of different genetics and you know fluctuations in your weight. You know, those all, those all will change your breasts, but the implant's fine. Um, this, this requirement like every 10 years, that's actually not true. You know, I would say most women think about it around the 10 year mark, typically. Um, women who've had implants for 20, 30 years, you know, I've seen them and they, they're, they're fine. They, implants are fine. Um, they just want to have like a little bit perkier, you know, brush shape because of the aging process or they want to downsize or, you know, some even want to upsize, but it's really a patient's desire. Um, as, so, a, as a matter of fact, how do you decide where you place them if it's a under or if it's a over the muscle uh, implant? How do you decide yeah. that procedure? So I think for this, for this discussion, since we're on a, you know, bodybuilding kind of channel, it's um, my, in my hands as a bodybuilder, who has a lot of experience with women who've had implants 20, 30 years, new implants. Um, I specifically know and understand the, the requirement training that women do in all the divisions of bodybuilding specifically, as well as other, you know, forms of, uh, of, um, of sports, you know, MMA, CrossFit, you know, all these different, you know, modalities of training. Um, 
So I understand the, the, the human anatomy a little bit better, more intimately, I guess, as a, as a medical professional um, that does breast augmentation. And really the, the key thing for me is that women who have implants under the muscle really should avoid strenuous training of their chest, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason is this chest muscle is very, very, very strong. And then when you start training, it takes years to happen, but if you start training very, very hard to make your muscle stronger, um, over time, over time, we're talking about it could take five years, it could take 10 years, it could be longer. What happened, that muscle starts pressing on your implant and what happens, your implant ends up on your armpit, mm -hmm. side of your chest. And it's a, it's a strength thing. So the stronger your muscle, the harder it pushes. It's really all there is to it, it's just anatomy. Mm. Um, and that's because the implant's under the portion of the muscle. And so I, my, when my patients I take care of, I've always discouraged them from training your chest specifically for the purpose of getting stronger and increasing your tone of your chest. You know, I would say most women don't need to train their chest. You're not gonna get, well, I'm gonna get in balance between my, my back and my front. No, it doesn't. I you wanna know, know I, if Corey trains chest. <laughs> I don't yeah. train chest any longer. Not I at don't, all. no. I might do some body weight push ups here and there, okay. but, um, but that's the extent of it. And certain tricep exercises, he'll tell you as well, oh, um, okay. just again to, to um, you know, avoid that, that mm -hmm. uh, separation. Yeah. What the women who have implants on the muscle feel that. When you contract your chest, you know it and you feel it, yes. right? Yeah. You feel it. So think about it. So really the two divisions or two kind of athletes that don't have implants under their chest muscle are bodybuilders, women's physique, yes. and um, powerlifters. Because you're actually, for bodybuilding specifically, and women's physique and bodybuilding, you're actually judged on your chest definition. You're judged on the musculature, mm -hmm. the density, the striation. So they need to see that. So putting an implant underneath the muscle kind of distorts the anatomy and the visual you know, appearance of the pectoralis major, which is that muscle. So an implant on top is, uh, makes more sense, not only for the aesthetics of or for the sport of bodybuilding, but really for functional aspect of it. So for the long term, you know, they're, they're not gonna have that problem of pushing that implant out to the side of the chest because the implant's on top of the chest. So you're able to train functionally normal. My power lifters too, they're training, they're doing bench presses, they can do whatever they want, no limitations. <clears throat> and they're able to do what they want, but you know, they're because their implants on top of their chest. And I would imagine also the recovery time is actually um, faster, right? If it's over the muscle, and Correct. it takes longer if it's under the muscle, Correct. right? One of the down, but one of the downsides for having an implant on top of the muscle is that you don't have the the soft tissue support to hold the implant up with with gravity and aging process. Okay. So what happens? The implant is just kind of sitting on just kind of your skin envelope, and with the bigger the implant. Gravity pulls down harder, right? And your implants are, your breasts are kind of sagging a little bit faster. It's just the nature of, you know, not enough, enough tissue holding things up. When the implant's under the muscle, you know, like Corey here, you know, that, that implant is it's being held up by the muscle because the muscle has some kind of resting tone at all times. So it's holding it up and it's resisting the force of gravity. It's resisting the force of the aging process. So in the long term, she's in, her breasts or implants are gonna stay exactly where I put them mm -hmm. for longer. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, another question I had regarding to that, let's say uh, if an athlete decides to just take them out and never put them back, right? Not have them replaced. What happens there with the extra skin? Is there a difference if the implant was on top or under the muscle? Typically, if you take the implants out, what happens, you will have, it depends on the size of the implant, right? But you will have a little bit of skin laxity. Um, and this, you know, most women would say, I want my skin a little bit tighter and have a little bit perkier, tighter breasts and the skin not flopping around everywhere. And that's called a breast lift. Mm -hmm. So it's a skin surgery. Breast lift surgery is a skin surgery. You just basically retailer the skin to get everything nice and tight. And then your breasts kind of stay where they are. And they're not sagging and deflated. So is that what most people end up doing when they have the explant where they have to do a breast lift with it? Yes. Okay, I didn't know that. I always kind of wondered that, so that's a good question. I mean, you, you would assume they have to do something, but hmm, no, no that was I mean, very just, common That's thing. one of the reasons I'm late today is one of, one of my patients, she just had, um, you know, she had breast implants for a long time and then she felt like she was having some symptoms um, associated with breast implants and hadn't taken out. And sure enough, I hear this all the time. I hear this all the time. Six months later, she's like, all my symptoms are the same. Yeah. It wasn't my implants. I got all these tests for nothing. And I want my implants back. And so here she is back again. She's getting her breast implants back. And I asked her, like, you know, what is it? What, what is it about the breast augmentation that make that you want back? She goes, and again, confidence. 
yeah. I just feel so much more confident in my physique and how I, I look and I just don't have that anymore. And it's, and, you know, I just, you know, I, I regret taking them out. I, I can't tell you how many times I hear that. I bet. Um, yeah. We've heard it a lot too from people in the industry and just yeah. friends and family who've all kind of been through that. Um, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we will come right back because we've got lots of other body parts we want to go through with you. So we'll be right back in just one second. People always ask how I got here. I was willing to work just a little harder than everyone else. Every damn day. If I can have hundreds of hours back, you know I'm going to grab them. Spending hours prepping chicken, rice, and vegetables, F that. I rely on perfect nutrition. I rely on trifecta. We're back with Dr. Morales and Cora Morales, who's joining us here talking about plastic surgery and the impact it has on the fitness industry. So we talked a little bit about breast dogs. Now I want to talk about the booty because this is something that everyone is all about the booty these days, right? But... Not everyone wants to do all the hard work in the gym. So they come to see you. What are some of the procedures besides, obviously there's butt implants or injections. Give us the download because I'm totally naive in this area and I'm very curious. You know, society now is all about the butt. You know, it just is what it is. You know, Corey's, you know, she trains her butt like three times a week easily. And, um, <laughs> You know, it, it's a part of the bodybuilding. Like you have a new new division, I think, strictly yes. to worship the butt, right? The wellness division. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. It's all about the butt. That's what the wellness is. So, um, you know, there's there's things that I can do to help. Um, I would say out of the, out of the industry of bodybuilding, you know, most common uh, procedure reform is called a uh, fat transfer or Brazilian butt lift, what's commonly sold as, which is basically we take liposuction. And we take that fat and we just kind of put in the areas where you want it, which is right now is uh, the buttocks right now. And um, that gives you a little more fullness back there. Women who decide to, I want a little bit bigger and fuller, you know, at some point, either they run out of fat or they need to go to the next level up, you know, for the proportions that they want. And sometimes the implants are used. It just kind of depends. Wow. Um, my athletes that want bigger butts, you know, my first answer always is just work out harder. You know, that's my yeah, answer. Yeah, because I would think that when you, know. you do that fat uh, injections, right, mm -hmm. don't they burn them off when they burn all the fat when we go through the diets? Right. Don't so we burn great, this well? is a great concept. I want everyone who's either bodybuilding or not to understand this is that you're born with a certain number of fat cells, period. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where your fat is on your body is very genetic. Some women are bottom heavy, they have bigger legs. Some women have it more in their face. Some have a little bit bigger arms. Some have a lot in their breasts, right? We're all made a little bit differently. When I take fat out of you, either I throw in the trash can from liposuction or I put it somewhere else in that body, that, body, that fat cells has that genetic predisposition to grow. So when I put it like in for women who want fuller butts, we put in their butt, when they do that, that transfer, and if they gain 50 pounds, their butt gets real big. It gets real big, right? It gets huge. <laughs> and then the areas I took the fat from, like their waist or stomach, doesn't get quite big as other parts of that body I didn't touch, like their arms or their face. So they, that's where this myth of like, oh, the fat moved. It didn't move. You just gained weight, right? Yeah. So your face got big, your arms got big because I didn't touch your arms, but your waist and your, and your abdomen and your back is still pretty lean because I took the fat from there and your butt's like crazy big. Vice versa, right? You, let's say mm -hmm. you lose 50 pounds after the surgery. What happens is that your butt is the last thing to go. Okay. It's the last thing to go. And we all know the process of leaning down. You see where you start getting leaner faster, right? Mm -hmm. So same thing, though, you know, if I took fat from your abdomen and your back to harvest for your butt, you know, those areas of abdomen, you'll get ripped out real quick. Your back is super, super lean real, real quick before your arms and your legs do. But your butt's the last thing to go. It's always that last thing to go. So, you know, I've you know, worked with a lot of patients that you're considering bodybuilding or gone from bodybuilding to, you know, more just a normal lifestyle. But it's a, it's a permanent fluctuation and how you gain and lose weight forever. It's a permanent thing. That fat cells don't burn off. It's just, it's whether or not you lose or gain weight. 
Okay, Does that Corey, make sense? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I want to ask Corey right now because you've been in the industry right. quite a lot. Yeah. Can you spot those girls that have uh, implants or fat injections on their butt on the stage? Can you spot that? Uh, for me, I, I mean, I have people that I would say I'm suspicious of, but I think Dr. Morales, he's the eagle eye when it comes to that. Like, he can pick those people out. And, oh, really? Um, we'll discourage people that still want to actively compete yeah. from getting implants. Now, if you're retired from competing, then you know yeah you do you but because it's quite obvious right we have divisions yeah. like even in the figure division some of the girls have striations on the glutes yeah. right mm -hmm. the moment you're gonna have implants or the fat transfer there mm -hmm. you're gonna obviously see that it's right. not anatomical right mm -hmm. well I've seen in the audience where the girls will turn and you can tell there's something that was implanted in there and because certain areas don't move or when they shift mm -hmm. you can tell that it's it's fake. Right. And that's just because in our sport, you lean down so much. Yeah. Like everyday life, probably not mm -hmm. if you were wearing pants. But in our sport, it's oh, really, yeah. really different. Now, I don't know it about the, um, the fat transfer. Is that easy for you to spot, Dr. Morales? Uh, fat transfer, I mean, I, you know, this is what I do every day, so I, you can't get anything past me. And if I see you in person <laughs> and I see you on stage, I'm, I'm going to pick you out. And I'm, I'm about 90% sure in pictures, just by seeing pictures online and stuff like that, whether or not you had stuff done. But, you know, this is what I do, and I'm not gonna call any athletes out, but there are pro, pro athletes with stuff that have been done. Oh, yeah. You know, this wellness division, if you look at the trend of wellness division, where it came from, really South America, you know, South America um, injectables are rampant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rampant, we're talking about injectables that they're, I mean, there's models, there's athletes, you know, these injections are, Similar to like the, they're like gels right now from what I understand. But, um, you know, historically, you know, bodybuilding had problem with synthol, which is still prevalent. Synthol is mm -hmm. an oil, right? Causes inflammation, makes the muscles get bigger. You know, it's, it's, it's happening more often than you think, unfortunately. Um, you know, the way wellness specifically is going, I think some of these women are going to start considering about doing these things. And it's going to be, you know, um, it's going to be a problem, unfortunately, for the sport um, because some of these these the proportions of how big their butts are to the rest of their body it's it's almost unbelievable and i i can see it um but you know it's just whether or not the judges are you know what they're going to reward i i, I, I do believe to that the, the, the fbb professional league will not allow obvious implants and stuff like yeah. that or re reward this kind of look but yeah. i had another question like once you do the implants or even the the fat transfer how do you train if, the, if somebody is a very active person that goes to the gym, do they have yeah. to train their glutes? Do they have to work around these, uh, these new augmentations? Right, great question. So, you know, gluteal implants specifically, it's, it's actually one of my specialties. I, I do this um, quite a bit. I don't work with athletes who want uh, gluteal implants. That's just one thing I will not do. Um, I just, I'm just opposed to it because, uh, first of all, you're, you know, I think that's not fair on the stage um, to your competitors. And second of all, you know how to get your butt bigger. You just got to train harder. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, the, it becomes more visible. And I, I don't want to ever have you know, someone say, well, Dr. Morales did that. And that answer is, that, no, he didn't. I did not. You know? um, but you know, when you have implants you know, with, uh, with, in, the, in the buttocks, what happens is that the implants typically partially in the muscle. So the muscle will always move a little bit differently. Um, you will you might see the edge of the implant most likely, and if you're a bodybuilder, it is very very hard to hide it. Um, I've seen some good good results. I, I'm not gonna lie, I've seen some really good ones, um, and I've seen some really bad ones. But um, for me, for my patients, whether you're an athlete or not, is I do not want them training their butt ever again. Just like breast, you're done. No more butt training. No more hip thrusts. Oh, no more lunges. No more squats. No more none of that. You're done. Wow. because you're augmented. There's no point in making your butt bigger because you have an augmentation. Um, because similar to you know the chest where we do the implants under the muscle, is with time and more force, what have you push the implant out the side. Same thing for the butt. For the butt, you end up pushing the implant out to the side on your hip. Wow. And mm -hmm. I've seen that. So it becomes more visible and then you have to, have to fix it. So I've so you're you know, getting a white so bod instead of a perk bod. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a reason alone not to do it in our industry yeah. if you think about it mm -hmm. because it's hard not to engage your glutes in any lower body exercise. Right. So yeah. if you're in the sport, you have to train. You have to train yeah. your whole body. So 
If you're considering yeah. butt, inje- or butt implants, maybe now you won't, <laughs> if you're Hopefully still actively I've, competing. I've had these discussions with some athletes that considered again to get back on stage, and I just, I truly would try to discourage them. Um, but, you know, everyone has their own, um, you know, own goals and whatever, but I just, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, keep everyone, reduce the risk of complications really in the future. So let's suppose that this trend goes away. And then people come to you and they say, take my butt implant away, I want to have a small butt again. What's going to happen with the shape of the butt, the skin, and so on? Well, as you probably expect, it would be the same thing with the breast. You have mm-hmm. some loose skin. So I think the future with implants or fat transfer, I think 10 years from now, you know, as plastic surgeons, we'll be doing a lot of butt reductions. Wow. Or a butt, a butt wow. lift, right? A butt lift, really, what the yeah. surgery is. Yeah, how do you do it? Like, you cut the skin and yeah. then the same thing? Pull up the booty under your hip? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what. Wow. You get to, you know, sitting on your upper butt to pull it up. Oh. You know, what's going to be more common is when you do a lower butt lift. So some women get a little bit extra skin on their lower butt along their fold. Yeah. You know, most women kind of see that when they start getting really, really lean, you get a little bit extra skin. Well, it's because your butt was bigger when you're in off season, you're big and full, you you know, but when you start deflating and especially as you get older, your skin gets looser mm-hmm. and you start getting a little more butt fold. I think in the future, after, you know, this trend of like this big butt thing goes away, that I'll be doing lower butt lifts, I'll be doing upper butt lifts, that's gonna be my future. Wow. <laughs> hey, I guess you could have a worse job. <laughs> Yeah. Well, some people say it's job security, right, Dr. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it, I'm just, hey, I'm just trying to make people happy. So, you know. Now, you talked about, this is off camera, but now I'm super interested about ab etching. I've okay. never heard of it. So give us your description of it and then we'll ask the doctor. <laughs> so from what I understand, obviously being married to him is it's really an artistic way to do liposuction that better defines your abdomen so that as you gain a little bit of weight um, back, you still have those lines that might otherwise not hey. be as visible as you're gaining uh, a little bit of weight. And so um, again, definitely not something that uh, he wants to do if you're still actively competing, but if you're um, retired and you maintain a fit lifestyle, then, you know, it makes sense. And you don't definitely want to have, like, popping abs and then you're, like, chunky everywhere yeah. else. Like, it needs <laughs> to make sense with, <laughs> with your body. All right, now now what do you say? <laughs> Was she pretty close? Very, very close. I mean, she's heard me talk about this quite a bit, and I, it's one of my specialties as well. I do abdominal etching, and it's... I, I find that ad, the people who want this are, like, models, um, former bodybuilders, those in the fitness community that know how to get six pack abs. They just don't, they can't maintain that consistent lifestyle of eating clean consistently um, due to work travel, just business. And, but they're used to looking fit all the time, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, having a body fat, a 25% body fat for someone who's been in the industry, it doesn't really, they don't feel comfortable with that. When they look like they're 10%. But what I do is I'm able to do liposuction. I'm able to sculpt, you know, the abdomen, make it look a little bit leaner. So you have someone that you know is eating and training and having a lifestyle at a body fat twenty five percent, and I'll make you look like you're ten percent, and everything stays the same other than I did the surgery. So you look <laughs> like you're ten percent, but you're really living at a twenty five percent body fat kind of lifestyle. Does that make sense? So yeah. are there scars though? Because like, where do you do the procedure, and is it obvious? Because of like liposuction, you can tell tummy tucks, you can tell. Can you no. tell on the abs where that you've had the procedure done? You know, I've done quite a bit of this. I'm, I, I use minimal incisions. They're about as big as a little laparoscopic incision. Oh, They're very, wow. very, very small. They're like five millimeters in length. And I put them in like a bikini line in the belly button. So I'm able to do all these, you know, different etchings of the abdomen and through those incisions. So I don't, I really don't like people seeing scars on for my patients. So I'm able to do that. Um, I, I, you know, I get this question a lot. I get, this is probably my number one request of surgery for me is, when can I have abdominal etching? And I look at them and if the, and if they don't look like they work out ever, my answer is no. It just yeah. doesn't look right. Just like Corey said, it's like yeah. you, know, you have someone point, who, who doesn't look like they're fit or ever been fit in their life. It, it makes no sense. It doesn't match. It doesn't look natural. But for people who work out and train, you look, they you just look at their body you're like, yeah, you look like you work out. And then we'll, I'll do an edge appropriately. So if you're you're fairly lean, you're like maybe 17, 15, 70% body fat. If I etch you, you're gonna look like you're seven. Um mm. So it just kind of depends on the patient. You know, for women, I do this thing called soft edge, which is really just enhanced aesthetic, a little bit more aesthetic of feminine, athletic appearance of the abdomen, a little bit of the midline, a little bit on the size of the six pack, 
not the six pack itself, but just the side of the six pack and just scrape everything out to the sides. Mm. And so you have that illusion of like, she, you know, she works out, she's in good shape, but not, not that hard six pack look like when you're really lean and training like Corey has right now. She's ripped yes. to shreds right now. And she didn't have the ab etching. She said that Dr. Morales not. would not do the ab etching oh, on her. No. Yes. So that is hard work and her booty too. Hard, booty hard is work. real. That's right. Yeah. And Dr. Morales, I want to move over to the face and see what kind of plastic surgery do we do on the face, but only after this commercial break. You diet down, train hard, and supplement smart for months. When the time comes to step on stage, don't leave your tan to chance. Go with the pros. Pro Tan. Number one worldwide since 1987 and the official sponsor of the Olympia for the last 15 years. Don't step on stage without it. Pro Tan. And we're back talking about plastic surgery. Now, Dr. Morales, we all know that most of us in this, in this industry, when we step on stage, we are so depleted, we have to diet down so much, right, that our faces look depleted, right? Well, they have, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we were to talk about that, how can you help in this situation? What kind of procedures can help? So thankfully, there's a lot of procedures now that we have that are non-surgical. Mm -hmm. um, so really, the specifically for bodybuilding and for women, and even for men too, we, we go through this deflation. It's really because we're losing facial fat. So, you know, what I always recommend for my athletes who are getting ready for stage and they, they kind of get that death face look real bad. Yes. Um, is that we can use uh, some facial fillers, which are just the gels of different mm -hmm. softnesses, and we can restore some of the volume, decrease some of the folding of the, of the wrinkles that you get from like the mid face and here along the folds and along the tear troughs. Um, it's not a permanent thing. So, you know, these fillers typically last, you know, four to six months typically. Um, but that kind of gets them through that, you know, that death face, you know, preparation of, uh, of prep. And it's, it's a little details. They look a little bit healthier on stage. They mm -hmm. look a little healthier on, on pictures. Um, you know, obviously good, good skincare is something I preach a lot. So Corey has, is, I'm on her, I'm full court press. So we make sure her skin is perfect all the time. And it is. Do you, do you have any? Uh, I don't have any fillers, um, just in terms of like, you know, addressing diet face at this point, but definitely using all the like good skincare products and getting like the peels and the, you know, facials and stuff like that for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, everyone, everyone kind of goes through, you know, has different, uh, I guess, degrees of death face. So, you know, Corey, thankfully she has good genetics. She doesn't have a lot of issues and definitely. Um, it would definitely help her if she was interested in doing that, but I, I don't see any issues for her. Um, I get death face real bad, so I, I personally do my own when I get there, I, and I kind of fill my cheeks in a little bit. Wait, right here in the you throat. do your own? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do wow. you? Wow. When do you do them? Like just get in a mirror and you're like, mm. that's crazy. It is crazy. I've seen him do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm highly impressed. But I, I don't know. You know, I do a lot of things to myself, but you know, um, <laughs> you, know I, you know, I just wanted to. For me, I started doing it just because I wanted to experience it, and that way I could tell my patients like this works. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gone through it, I've done it, I've, you know, I've had the bruising, I've had the swelling, like I, I want to experience these things um, that I'm recommending to my patients, right? It's not just something I'm selling you, I'm actually recommending because I've done it and I believe it and I think it works. And so, you know, for me, I, you know, I, I'm pretty lean. When I get, you know, around four weeks, I'm pretty lean in my face and people think I look more tired, I, they think I'm sick, you know, I get those comments and so I, I didn't like that anymore. So I wanted to kind of fill my face up a little bit more, not, not overdone, just kind of keep myself a little more healthier looking. And I think it, you know, my last season I did, I did that, and I think it helped me quite a bit. Um, and I felt more confident. Yeah. That's where that word is again. Yeah. Confident. No. Yep. You know, I had, a, I, I didn't feel like I was death face. I wasn't kind of hiding from the camera. I wasn't adjusting my face, so my shadows didn't look so bad. So, um, you know, this is something that, you know, some of the athletes, you know, who are interested should considering maybe doing some, you know, just don't overdo it. Don't ever overdo it, but just enough to kind of stay healthy looking. And I think it makes mm -hmm. a difference. You so know, when you're on, a, you... on the competitive stage, especially the pro league stage, where all these little details make a difference. Oh, yeah. Right? But my question so, was, when would you recommend um, these non-invasive procedures compared to a, a mini or a facelift? So non-surgical non procedures for volume purposes, to restore volume and stuff like that, you know, those can be done, you know, for women in their 40s, 50s. Mm -hmm. You know, as the aging process continues, we lose a little collagen in our face, and so our skin is a little bit looser, so you can fill it up. 
But when you have like skin sag where it's like just loose and sagging and you start getting jowls and, you know, next up, that's when you need skin surgery. We actually tighten things. Mm -hmm. And that's called like a mini facelift or a full face or neck lift. And so those women in their 50s, you know, tend to start are interested. Right now, the average age for a facelift is somewhere around the 52, 52 year old uh, mark. Mm -hmm. um, historically, it was older, it was like 58. Um, but that's the trend of society. Like women are just unfortunately are expected to look younger longer. And so the trend of, you know, cosmetic surgery for face surgery is coming down, is coming, is getting younger, oh, which yeah. is not necessarily a bad thing because the younger you have surgery in your face, the longer it lasts because you have better skin. Your skin is thicker, it's healthier, you know, it's, it, it tends to hold up a little bit better. So it, it, you know, every patient's a little bit different, you know, ethnicity is a big difference. Um, oh, yeah. How you take care of your skin up until the point where you need procedures for your face, super, super important. And I preach that all the time is, you know, good skincare for women, specifically the face is, is preventative aesthetic medicine. You got to take care of your skin. You got to use your sunscreen. You got to all the moisturizers, all the growth factors, like that stuff is really important because you will, your, your aging process will be slowed down. And um, I, I'm a strong proponent. Obviously you can see my wife and she, she gets oh, the yeah. best of what I can give her. Yeah, which actually brings me to a question. Is it hard to be married to a plastic surgeon? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, definitely feel like there's some expectation on me that I would, you know, represent his brand well, that I would, um, you know, look the part, right? Um, but thankfully, I mean, um, he, he hasn't had to do like a lot of work on me. I am getting the benefit of it. So from that regard, not hard at all. It's easy to, to <laughs> soak in all the benefits of it. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, it's definitely a blessing. I feel like I would probably at least once a week be like, so what do you think about this or this? And <laughs> my husband would probably be like, enough, enough. Right, right. <laughs> no, yeah, that is one thing about him is he's super observant. So even things I don't like want him to observe, he's always watching and yeah. observing. And I know that. I'm like, ugh. And I would be <laughs> like, okay, I can count on you. Whenever it's time, you just let me know. I'll be there. Like, yes. <laughs> tell me what I need, babe. <laughs> Now, Dr. Morales, what is this trend with threading? What are your thoughts on that for the face? So threading is interesting. It's a new kind of um, aspect of cosmetic medicine for the face. And what it is are these absorbable sutures, suture material that have like little barbs on them. Mm -hmm. And so these, these, uh, these threads are placed on a needle and they're placed in different parts of the face, like on the brow, they're in the mid face and here, and they're placed under the skin. And then what happens, you take the, you set the barb and you pull on it Mm. from where an incision up here and it pulls the soft tissue up, okay? So it's not as violent as you think. It's actually, you know, supposedly it's pretty comfortable. Um, the, the, this bar material doesn't last very long, unfortunately. So, you know, yes, the immediate results like, wow, that looks amazing. There's no facelift scars. Oh my God. And then not even a year later, like, yeah, that didn't do anything. It just oh, doesn't wow. last long. It doesn't even last a year, huh? It mm. doesn't. It doesn't last very long, and it's very, very, very technician dependent. I'm talking about extremely technician dependent. You need someone who does a lot of them. Um, obviously, you need to get better results from you know board certified plastic surgeons. Who this is what we do. We understand anatomy, but unfortunately, that, that any any doctor or now you know practitioner like nurses are doing them, and um, they just don't have the skill set and they don't understand anatomy. Unfortunately to get better results. And so you're getting complications associated with infection. You're getting to contour irregularities where you can see mm -hmm. these thread lines mm. on the face. You can see these lines is they just weren't placed right. So it's very, very technician dependent. So I encourage people who are considering it, please, please find someone who does a lot of them and uh, that you trust, you know, please, yeah. please trust your local plastic surgeon, please. Now we, we talked about a lot of body parts. Is there anything that you that we didn't talk about that you think it would improve the appearance on the stage of either a male or a female athlete that yeah. we haven't talked about? Well, one thing I do like that is trending now um, that society becomes more health conscious, and um, we're, you're hearing these transformation stories of you know people who've you know gotten to health and fitness and they lost all this weight, they lose all this weight, um, but the consequence of that they have extra skin. And so I'm doing a lot of these contouring surgeries for, um, for women who've had like loose skin of their abdomen and like their butt or their body or their arms or legs. Like it's just basically skin. And, and at that point I become like a skin tailor. So my job is to kind of retighten this, the, the body structure so it's nice and tight and try to hide scars that are low and, you know, conce in low concealed places of underwear and, you know, bikinis and stuff like that. 
So I work with men for, you know, body lifts. You've lost 200 pounds. You know, I just worked, recently worked with a patient who lost uh, 300 pounds wow. through diet and exercise. It took her years, but she wow. did it. And she Good had skin all over her body. So it took me a year to get through her. And we did her arms, she did an arm lift, I did a breast lift, I, we did implants, I did a back lift, I did a wow. full body lift, I did a thigh lift, wow. I did a mons, I mean, did, I basically lifted every part of her body, essentially. And this was um, over a year span? For my surgery, we went through three stages of surgeries, wow. yeah. Because, you know, these transformations, you look at her before and after picture, it's on my profile, but, you know, her before and after picture, she's like, totally, totally different people. Wow. You know, something with 500 pounds and now it's like 150 pounds. Like you, you can't even, I, I can't even fathom like, you know, at, at, and like losing that amount of skin. It's just tons of skin. That's incredible. So, um, you know, that's what's, I'm seeing that more often now. And that's why you see these transformation divisions that are not obviously NPC um, indoors, but there's trans transformation division where people have lost a lot of weight and they, you know, they're confident again. They got some confidence back because they lost all the weight because they know what they used to look like. Big difference, right? Mm -hmm. And they feel better. They're curing diabetes or curing hypertension because their blood pressure is so high. You know, they don't have rashes anymore. Like it's a, I think it's great. I, I really like to see that people are starting to appreciate the importance of health and fitness and how it can help you live it longer. And just one of the consequences for them, we have skin and that's just kind of what I'm able to do. And one other thing too that I have to ask about, cause we've talked now, I think twice about your skincare regimen. So you gotta share what, what brand, what products do you use personally that you think are the most beneficial? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Skin Medica is a big one mm -hmm. um, that I've used. And then also, um, what is the, uh, Neocutis is one that I've used a lot um, from Roland Spa. And uh, Roland, do you have other ones top of mind? Elastin. So, Elastin, you yeah. know, for skincare, you know, your, your, your skin becomes accommodated to certain kind of things. Like you kind of have to change it up, just like training. So I had Corey, we kind of, we make a different kind of adjustment. We don't make adjustment like every year, okay. just kind of you know, as she ages, you know, just kind of changes up a little bit, you know, try different, you know, com complex of growth factors or different component moisturizers, you know, and then I'm treating her face with, you know, light peels and light laser peels. And, you know, these little things make a big difference in the long run. So you can't do the same thing for years and years, years, you know, really we have across the board, we have great skincare products that are out available. You know, always, you're always gonna get better products in doctor's offices, like past surgeons and dermatologists, than just finding something over the counter at like Dillard's or something like that. Um, but you know, just do something be great. I mean, I'm okay mm -hmm. with just normal stuff. You gotta do something. And if you really want the best investment in the long term, you know, the, the better better lines of skincare products are always gonna be the my recommendation. Yeah, good to know. I mean, obviously it's something, it, if we're in this sport, we obviously care about our physique, our appearance, but Sometimes we've got to be reminded of these little details too. Yeah. That's why I ask, because I need to change up my, my face regimen, that's for sure. But I'm, I'm yeah. curious now, what's in store for you guys as far as stage is uh, <laughs> involved? Where are you going to compete next, Corey? And where are you going to compete next, Dr. Morales? Okay, well, for me, I'll be competing at the Savannah Pro yeah, yeah. Labor Day weekend. So I was super excited about that for my first show of mm -hmm. uh, you know 2021 and then a couple other shows probably after that. Um, yeah. But we'll definitely be at the Olympia supporting um, the Olympia, babe. What are your plans? <laughs> well, my plan uh, is kind of cruising right now. I'm, I'm keeping my physique right now at kind of like an eight weeks out kind of physique. So I'm kind of, you know, if I want to jump into something, I got eight weeks to kind of work with. But oh, okay. um, That's nice. I'm very comfortable with my lifestyle, my, my profession and my family and, you know, trying to trying to keep this one, let me let me stay with it a little bit longer, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys did so well, you know, coming up as the amateurs and then gaining your pro cards together. So it's just fitting that you continue on in that journey. Oh, yeah, and definitely you know, I both, know that- we, we both really just enjoy the lifestyle. I mean, I, I love the community of bodybuilding. I love working with athletes specifically, but you know, we've gotten so much in the sport of bodybuilding. Um, for me personally, and it's helped me be a better person actually. I'm more dedicated, more disciplined, I under, and I'm able to me, and I have patients tell me that they're inspired by me. And for me, I mean, I don't think there's a bigger compliment when someone tells you that you're, they inspire you. Um, so, and I think Corey gets the same thing. Like people, I know my patients love her because mm -hmm. she, they find her inspirational because she's 
you know, she was a career mom. She was a body, active bodybuilder. She raised two kids. She has to deal with me. Like, she has a lot of things going on, you know? <laughs> well, and you guys are both so down to earth and, like, chill. I, I've been fortunate enough to know you both for several years. But always, if you see either of them at any shows, um, do not hesitate to reach out. Do not hesitate to ask questions. And obviously, he's an amazing plastic surgeon. So and we appreciate having you on the show to answer all these questions. And we sure. are absolutely looking forward to seeing you at the Olympia. I know that you're one of the main sponsors at the Olympia this October. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for giving back, back to the industry. The Olympia uh, sponsorship. And, uh, you know, as long as they'll have me, I'll continue to support the sport and be an ambassador of the, of the, of the of the lifestyle. That's fantastic. <laughs> well, thank you guys both so much for being here thank in you. person and for joining us. We know how busy you are, Dr. Morales, but amazing information, amazing content. So thank you so much. And that wraps up another episode of FemFlex Friday. Mm -hmm.